Well, hi, friends, and welcome to another, I'm here, <laughs> friends again, <laughs> my Magic Morning Wood friends. Uh, welcome to back to uh, another episode of the Magic Morning Wood. How's it going, Clive? Hey, my good buddy, Ron. How's it going? I'm fine. I'm great. Thanks. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, nice to meet you. Do Hello. Welcome again. to the Wood. Magic Morning Wood. <laughs> so uh yeah so uh, we're picking up our algorithm from the last uh episode the last episode we did uh uh we finished off with house of 1000 corpses the rob zombie movie so uh so i picked my reaction which uh obviously made sense which i went with the sequel which is the devil's rejects which we actually already mentioned that i chose that already so we mentioned that last episode mm. so the um yeah so i picked the uh, it was 2005, I guess, two two years later, right? So uh, a couple years later, he guess I guess House of One Thousand Corpses was uh, well enough received, I guess, by the general populace to uh, uh, give him uh, enough financing to make another, to make a sequel. Uh, I think people who do has, like Rob Zombie films really, yeah, like yeah, I think he has his 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 fans, and I have to say, I I don't dislike them. I think they they are they definitely are in a uh, they're they're a niche market I think <laughs> uh, and I think uh, uh, I I don't dislike them as much as you do I think he has a interesting take on things and uh, I I I generally in, enjoy them I, I don't I don't think he is ever a perfect filmmaker but I think he definitely has a vision and a uh, he has a um, how can I put this like he has a he has a very specific style that he yes, is facing. He has a point of view, doesn't he? He's got a world. Yeah. But yeah, let's so... put the phone there for a minute there, Ron, because I, I I, actually don't remember at all, to be honest. But did you get on with the two Halloween films you made when we spoke? I did. Remember, I, I liked them more than you did, right? Oh, okay. So I remember we did. Okay. Yeah, so I liked them better so than you did. So uh, if, uh, I, if I remember correctly. So, but uh, yeah, I did... I did like them more than you did so and um yeah so i think he uh i i don't dislike his movies i i don't like love them i'm not like crazy you know super big rob zombie fan but uh i i like them enough that i'd watch them right so and i and that like it's a rob zombie movie, like it, it interests me enough to actually go out and maybe actually watch it so do you like white zombie uh i think i I don't actually know much of his music. I, I know like the one one or two songs that were famous back in the 90s mm -hmm. when it was sort of played on the radio, but uh, I don't, I've don't. i never really listened to a White Zombie album. So, I, so you I obviously think. weren't that taken by the more you would have... Uh... Mm, I mean, I like his couple of songs, the more human than human or whatever it is and or whatever the other ones, but they're, they're, they're okay. It's not exactly my style of music, but I, I don't, again, same as his movies, I don't dislike them. Right. I'll listen to it if it's on, but I don't. Uh, I don't like it. Eh, I like that kind of thing. So, yeah. Right. Thank you. All right. So right. anyway, uh, two thousand five, uh, the Devil's Rejects. He uh, a sequel to the House of One Thousand Corpses, where he um, gets sort of the uh, in the House of One Thousand Corpses, he has kind of a larger family. There's a lot more kind of members of the family, and this one he sort of takes kind of the main three. Uh, and uh, puts them on a on a basically a road trip. They're sort of escaping from the cops. It sort of picks up a little bit after where the other one leaves off. I guess, but it's uh, about a year later. Um, and uh, they're still doing their killing stuff and their twisted family stuff. And um, um, I'm guessing there yeah. must be a house of one thousand two hundred fifty three corpses or something. Probably yeah. By that point, yeah. So. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and the other ones are still and, and you see, uh, so obviously the, whatever's happened most recently, I don't know if it's based on the events from the first film or if it's something else has happened, but the cops have finally, uh, come to, uh, understand what's happened, what's been happening here. And they're doing, it starts with a big raid on their house and they, and kind of a big shootout. Um, uh, Manson stroke, Ruby Ridge stroke. Wick or kind of event, right? Exactly, right. So, yeah, um, and uh, yeah, and so, um, so they all kind of escape except for Mama, uh, who has been recast, 
uh, from she was uh, Karen Black in the first movie, but she's been recast as Leslie Easterbrook mm. in this one. Uh, was that because that she died? Is that why she was recast? Or no, apparently Karen Black wanted oh, uh, more, more money. money. That's right. Yeah. yeah, too much money. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, anyway, so she gets uh, arrested, and while the rest of them make their getaway, and uh, uh, the three main ones, which is. Uh, uh, or the two main ones, I guess, Baby and Otis, they kind of get away and they meet up with Captain Spaulding later and they become kind of the three of them. And this makes it more clear that Captain Spaulding was part of the whole gang from the beginning. And as I mentioned last episode, he, I guess, is their dad, I guess, I, or something like that, I guess. Right. So um, somehow related. Uh, they, they don't call him or she calls him dad, but Otis doesn't. And uh, yeah, basically uh... The father, the dad. The yeah, but he he lives uh, like a, alone with he's got he's got a whole a sequence where he's like dreaming of uh, being with some other girl and he kind of has his whole whole life in his own house, but he's somehow connected with them. So, um, yeah. Anyway, so she uh, um, meets up with them and it becomes the three of them. And uh, also the uh, um, Matthew McGrory is the giant. Uh, kind of escapes as well and kind of lives. In the woods or something, you don't really. He kind of shows up as like a Deus Ex Machina at the end of the movie, but uh, um, yeah. And anyway, anyway, so it's sort of like a, this is more of a natural born killers kind of, you know, like uh, you know, cross country crime spree pursued by the you know relentless uh, you know F, you know policeman or FBI agent, whatever it is, the William, sheriff, the sheriff, William Forsyth, right? by. By an always intense William Forsyth. I like I like me some William Forsyth. <laughs> yeah, William Forsyth is always like exactly the same. Really, I like I like William Forsyth when he shows up, but he's always he's always like really intense. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. always intense and like he does do different. So if you think about his, um, in raising Arizona, he's also mm. kind of intense, but he's like a, he's like a child or something in that. Like home. a crazy thing. Yeah. yeah, so. yeah. He's yeah. not this kind of scary, but but always it like he never he never does a chilled out. Role. No, he's right. never. Yeah, I love to, to see him like he play like a. Uh, we're also going to talk today about uh, your your movie. I love to see William Forsyth as Cisco Pike. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the um yeah so anyway so he's sort of like uh and I guess uh I I, I couldn't really tell but was so William Forsyth's brother has been killed by them. Mm. Was also a cop, but did you see that character get killed? Was he in, was he in the shootout at the beginning, or I don't know? They, they and he he's like a recognizable actor. The guy, uh, I forget what his name is, but um, the guy who played the brother in the picture, but I couldn't tell if he was an actual actor or not. Anyway, that um, Tom Tolles' character. Because Tom Tolles was in the first film, right? Yeah, but I don't think he it was the, the same character, film. or I don't think it was the same character. But uh, he did get killed in the first film, didn't he, Tom Tolles? So I'm wondering if it might be. Yeah, Tom but he, but he, I don't think he was in the 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 sheriff in the first film was had a different name, I think. I don't, yeah, so I don't, I don't know. care enough to, to. But it is Tom Tolles though, because he is also he he is the guy. Yeah. But was he in the first film? Yes. Okay, so it was, so it is him yeah, then. Yeah, so, I think yeah. so, yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, anyway, so yeah, so it's him. Also, Michael Berman makes a makes a show up as well. Yeah, uh, it's another link yeah. from from the barbarians yeah. from our last episode. Also, Steve Rails back. I was like, is that Steve Rails back? Uh, I had to look it up. Mm. It is yeah, it's Steve Rails back's in it for like two minutes. Or There's a lot of people in it for like two minutes. Right? Ginger Lynn and PJ Souls and. Mm. Trejo has got a slightly bigger role. Yeah, bro, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's so, so I think a lot of like uh, probably people that Rob Zombie likes, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and his friends and, and, his, and Ken yeah, just, from Dawn like his, Dead. Yeah, his uh, it's probably his like um excuse to meet get to meet these yeah. people that he used to yeah. probably grew up loving, right? So yeah, again, um, it's fanboy filmmaking, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, really. Yeah, so he throws them all in there, and then they go on this sort of like uh cross country and this one uh foregoes the supernatural element that was in the first one and it's just a straight up like uh good old fashioned killing yeah it's like a charles stark weathery kind of thing yeah. kind of yeah 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 and yeah. so they go off and and you know you know terrorize and torment people as they go and uh ends kind of like the wild bunch 
Yeah, yeah. Well, went, yeah. So it's yeah. yeah, they're kind of avoiding the sheriff, and then they have their yeah. It's just, I mean, it's just essentially like a series of vignettes of them finding a person and torturing them and killing them, and moving to another person, and torturing and killing it. So really, um, it's yeah, it's it's quite uh, uh, yeah, it's quite repetitive in that. Respect. Kind of repetitive, night. and then they do meet uh, Sid Haig's uh, character, uh, calls someone uh, called uh, Charlie Altamont, who ends up is a gay, uh, uh, made played by Ken Tori, who uh, is a uh, I guess an old friend, and he kind of runs this sort of I don't know like backwater, like red light town. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> the border, it's like a border town, uh, like the one that. Um... In from dust till dawn, that kind of thing. Mm, yeah, exactly. Yeah, which I found really kind of interesting. I was like, that just they, I, I assume d- places like that must exist, do they? Yeah, I guess, but... like places in Tuan now, places like yeah, that. I guess. But I was like, how do they find like people to work at these? It's like, <laughs> I was curious how they find like employees, like they. <laughs> if he's, uh, uh, anyway, so. clearly they put ads in the local paper yeah it's in the local paper right so um anyway so then he ends up like betraying them because uh you know sheriff white all kind of you know, threatens him and then he kind of sells them out and uh yeah and so then and, and uh you know kind of uh, they escape and you know there's lots of uh and then um sheriff white is sort of like getting his own vigilante justice he kind of throws the law out and he wants justice for his brother he and he's to be just as psychopathic as them yeah, exactly as they are and he's like sort of nailing otis's hands into the chair and stuff of like that and ends up uh uh and ends up uh kind of trying to strangle baby and then uh, math mcgrory shows up uh, as i said a deus ex machina at the end and just uh breaks his neck for comes out of nowhere and then uh yeah and then they get away and then kind of uh it ends in sort of a shoot out blaze of glory as they speed towards a mm. kind of a uh a car a police car blockade right? and i'm so, assuming they survived because there's another because there's a part three yeah exactly right so you, you're supposed to i think think that they because they're being shot you could see them being shot but it, yeah. yeah i haven't seen the part three three no, from no. hell which just but released they, a couple years ago no, it's like 14 years after this right so yeah it's like only a few years ago right so uh, so obviously, and it, I and I read the synopsis for that, and it says that they were they're escaping from prison. So you assume that they lived or were given medical attention, and then put in prison, and now they escape and do it again. I guess right. So, That's but, a thirteen year gap. I, I I don't mean to be mean or anything, but considering that her whole character is a big part of it is based sexy. on kind of being all sexy and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, baby. Yeah, that, yeah. So is that gonna work? Like, I'm I'm, I'm curious. I, to be honest. I mean, as much as I mean, these movies are not—they're not perfect, but I mean, they're watchable for me at least. I'm—I'm—I'm—I'm I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, curious about this movie. I just want to see how it works because it's so far removed, and it's supposed to be the same characters. And I—I'm really—and I heard it was kind of disappointing. I heard some some reviews for it, but but I'm—I'm—I'm uh, I'm, 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 I'm curious just to watch it because I just want to see what he does with yeah. it. I'll He's see it in a few lessons. years. I need to calm down a bit i've just watched two in a fucking row so because I, I think also i mean he's he's made quite a few movies now and i feel like he's must have learned some lessons so i'm, I'm curious yeah, if i mean i if i saw anything, so. i saw the last one of his i saw and i didn't like it at all was the lords of salem right okay and that was yeah. before that yeah. and there's another one he's made i haven't seen called 31 and there's mm, the, the one i i think might work for me the one he made one animated film, didn't he? Um, Did he? Like a Mexican wrestler, like Adventures of El Super Beast or something like that it's called. I'm a little bit curious to see... Oh, that. The Haunted World of El Super Beasto. Yeah, there we go, yeah. I'm slightly oh, okay. curious to see that. Never heard of it. Uh, yeah. That was a while back, though. That was uh, maybe even before this, actually. So, yeah, so Devil's Rejects. What did you make of it, Ron, and how did it compare to House of 1000 Corpses? Well, I think uh, I think it in general it's it was a better movie than that was the, I think it it, uh, it dealt with some of the flaws from the first one. Um, of course, it, as you said, it's a little bit repetitive, and uh, uh, again, it kind of has one of the flaws from the first movie that it didn't fix is is starting up here and kind of staying up yes, there. I think right. Yes, so yes. I think it's the same. Thing. I think that's just his style, though. Is he I likes to so, stay yeah. up there and just the doing things there. <laughs> yeah. So there's not a lot of uh, uh, breaks. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's not a lot of uh, uh, dynamic shifts or whatever. But uh, um, yeah, I thought, again, I thought the performances were fine. The uh, uh, gore was pretty interesting. It was pretty good. He did some interesting, you know, things with uh, the kills and stuff like that. And uh, uh, it was, you know, it held my attention at the very least. You know, I think, I think in general, it was, uh, it flowed better than the first one because a lot of the first one had a lot of there's a lot of kind of like choppy filmmaking in the first one uh whereas this one kind of i think he learned a few lessons in terms of a filmmaker uh, but yeah again it's not a perfect movie definitely could have used uh, uh some editing and it's a little bit long an hour 50 this one so it definitely could have used uh some editing but um uh, yeah, I don't know what about you. Why'd you make off with the uh, Devil's Rejects? Well, I agree with you that it's an improvement on the first film. And actually, when I first saw this film when it was new, I remember actually quite liking it. Mm -hmm. I, I remember being quite surprised. I was like, oh, wow, this is so much better than mm -hmm. Thousand Thousand Copses. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually actively enjoyed it. Um, mm -hmm. And I was expecting to this time, but no, like, Maybe it was watching it straight after House or something, but it was mm. just because it was the same, like you said, it was the same mm. talk carried over mm. just ah, from the beginning. I was like, right. oh. and um, yeah, no, it, it it irritated me almost as much as the first one, but it is definitely a better film and mm. it's somewhat less interesting. And it's automatically better than the first one just because it actually had one scene that I found funny. Mm. Which was when they figure out that Captain Spaulding is a reference to the Marx Brothers, mm. and they hire some highfalutin. Oh, oh, the, oh, the guy, the guy who was with you. Yeah, well, he comes <laughs> over there and he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. and he insults Elvis, and William Forsyth <laughs> gets in his face. And um, for some reason, I thought that scene was kind of hey. funny. Um, yeah, the, the the movie critic guy here, so yeah, I thought that was kind of funny, and the fact mm. that William Forsyth got so angry because he had to go at Elvis, um, right? That kind of, but again, if that was in a another film, uh, it might not have, you know, in an in a good comedy, it would right. be one of the least funny scenes, if you see what I mean. Right, right, right. Yeah. But in the middle of all this shouting and shooting and go and all that, it was like a little. Oasis of a mm. kind of a lighter touch, and I quite like right. that. It right. seemed unusual, um, and then it just went back to doing what it normally does, right? Um, yeah, right. Yeah, mm. um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't have much more to say about it. I I was kind of surprised that um, that I I I I thought I did like this film more, but uh, it turns out no. Not much. No. <laughs> well, you, you said it's cyclical, right? So maybe you're just on the downbeat, right? Maybe you'll watch it again in 10 years and you'll, you'll like it again. I don't know. I, I can't imagine what I was thinking. I might have been high or drunk or something. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> it's really possible. But, uh, but yeah, I can't imagine why I would have enjoyed it the first time around. Like you, I'm slightly curious to see Three from Hell, but I, I need a break. I, I, I won't be getting it good for a while. I'll just put it on the... Right. On the back, I might, I might watch it and I'll let you know. Right, so I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll get to the monsters before I get to right, right, right. Hell, I think. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah I just want to see what he did, did with it. Now he wrapped it up or whatever. So, mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, I guess that's about it for uh, Rob Zombie. So, moving on to uh, your reaction, right? So, yes, yeah, so I went with uh, Karen Black mm -hmm. and uh. I was looking through Karen Black's filmography and uh, I actually I sent you a message. I, was, I kind of quite um, never really thought about it before. I've always liked Karen Black and I know she does interesting things, but fucking hell, she's got a lot of really interesting films in her filmography. I mean, a whole bunch of stuff. I was like, oh, yeah, she's in that. And she's in that. She's in, oh, she's in that. She's in, like things either I'd seen and I liked or things that I uh, wanted to see that I haven't seen yet. Though It's quite a very, very interesting uh, list of films if you ever take a look at it. So I decided to go for a film. Uh, I hadn't seen before, uh, but I kind of almost be seen for about close to 30 years now, because I remember this being on television when I was a teenager and I was away from home and asking my father to tape it for me 
off of television and he didn't. He forgot. So I didn't get to see it. And then Dad. I, Yeah, I was like, oh, I want to see Cisco fight. And then it's just been one of those films. It's one of the how can I say, it's one of the one of those seventies films. And you either know what I mean or you don't. One of those seventies films that I have yet to get round to. Like I've I've seen most of those types of 70s films, but this was one I hadn't got round to. I've had a copy for years, just never got round to it. Upgraded recently, I had a HD copy. And, uh, oh, Karen Black's in it. I thought, okay, time to watch uh, Cisco Pike, finally. Um, so this stars um, Chris Christopherson uh, in his first uh, starring role. Uh, I think he had been in um, Dennis Hopper's The Last Movie uh, before this, but you know, everyone was in. I think we were in Dennis Hopper's the last movie. We just don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. There were so many drugs on set. Um, so this is his first starring role, and he is the titular Cisco Pike. This is a 1971 U.S. production set in. Uh, ah, it's Los Angeles, right? It's uh, it's quite. I quite what I quite like about this film uh, is it's it's very um, it's very specific, localized L.A. Right? It's not the big. Uh, LA of like heat or something like that. It's a, a very kind of um, street level Los Angeles. I would imagine this is a film that's more enjoyable if you know Los Angeles, Los Angeles. Right. if you know these neighborhoods. I, would, I get that. Right. And maybe even some of it's changed over the years. So it's, an, it's a bit of a kind of time capsule of a, you know, mm -hmm. there's like a, you, at the beginning, he's this town and he's like walking across like this little like a stone bridge over like a I think mean, mm. that's still there. Like, I don't know. It's not your image of modern, LA. right? Right. Um. So basically, he's try. He's a former drug dealer who's trying to go straight, and he's also a mu musician, kind of playing himself, right? And uh, you hear Chris Christopherson songs on the soundtrack. It's kind of like a country type folk, folky. Mm. Uh, but uh, Gene Hackman. Plays a crooked cop whose signature tune seems to be um, Sunny Terry, right there. Woo -hoo! <laughs> <laughs> Every time you see him, you hear the Sunny Terry thing, which uh, Ben Hurd Song uses in a bunch of his films, actually. But I, I like that too. But it's a good soundtrack, actually. And um, Gene Hackman is a corrupt cop who basically, it's never really explained why. Like, I don't know if he's got people after him for if he's mm. a dog, but for some reason, he's just decided he needs to shift. A whole load of um, weed, which I guess he's s stolen from the police lockup or something. Again, it's never oh, really yeah. explained, but he's just like, okay, I need you to shift this weed for me. And if you do, um, you know, I can get you off this kind of impending mm -hmm. drug charge that he's on. Right? Right. Like if he'll get caught one more time, he'll go into prison, right? Uh, and his uh, Chris Christopherson's girlfriend is played by. Karen Black, Black, who was actually very good, I think, in this film. And, um, yeah, he basically tries to go around. He's pressured into selling this weed without telling her. Uh, he's kind of do, trying to do it secretly, right? Um, Which I didn't really get why he didn't just tell her. Because, <laughs> obviously, it, it, it created a lot of tension and negativity. Yes. And I was like, well, why not just tell her? Like, I don't know why it had to be a secret. So I think she would. I agree with you. I think she would have been on his side if he just said, look. If he just had told her exactly what yeah. was happening, she would, have, she would have helped him. Yeah. 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 So that was it was kind of like a um, like a, a pretense for like some conflict, which I didn't think I didn't yeah. buy. Right. It's the one thing. Yeah. You have to buy into it or the, the film kind of collapses a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but um, yeah, I, I did decide to buy it. But there we go. Um, but you're quite, you're quite, you're quite right. I was wondering why you didn't tell her as well. So yeah, so then it's basically a kind of quite relatively laid back kind of episode. Not relatively, it's it's very very laid back. <laughs> yeah, it, it's laid back, a laid back thriller. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Chris goes off and then going round, and uh, Harry Dean Stanton turns up. Uh, there's a great scene with Antonio Fargas. Um, oh, he hooks up with. Um, uh, Warhol, Star Viva, and uh, Joy Bang as well. There's a couple of girls he meets and gets it on with when he's trying to. And yeah, so it's it, yeah, it's 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 laid back, it's episodic, it's very it's very 1971, and um, yeah, and 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 that's about it. I mean, nothing, nothing really unexpected. 
happens and there's a somewhat kind until of, the end right yeah it's kind of an ironic ending right i guess um and and yeah he's trying to get back in i mean there's a, a lot of character stuff right so there's like mm. He's trying to shift away from drug dealing and trying to get back into musician, uh, be a musician. But then he goes and visits a musician friend to plays demo, as played by uh, Doug Sam of uh, Sir Douglas Quintet, right? And um, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. all right, but uh, can you get us some more weed, basically, right? Like he can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he realizes, oh shit, I've become the weed guy, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, he's, they weren't really interested, interested in his music, so yeah. Oh no, no. So a lot of character stuff like that, basically, and um, yeah, a lot of LA stuff and. Uh, uh, yeah, um, directed and written by uh, B. L. Norton, who had made the quite well-regarded TV horror movie Gargoyles just before this. Seems to have done a lot of TV, actually, mostly TV. And Robert Town of Chinatown fame and many other things worked uncredited on the screenplay. And it, yeah, it's a, it's a chill, 70s counterculture cops and robbers film, I guess. Uh, how did you get on with uh, Cisco Pike, Ron? Huh? Uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, it was, uh, uh <laughs> it was okay. I mean, it was okay. It was, uh, I think it, it had the opposite problem that Rob Zombie movies have was that it, it didn't go high enough. Oh, really? you know what I mean, okay. like, okay. yeah, I, it's sort of like, it, it's sort of like it, 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 Rob Zombie movies are all up here. So it's like, was all down here, okay. despite the fact that it needed to go up sometimes, you know I mean? It is a thriller, but I just felt you know, it, you know. I mean, Chris Christopherson was decent. He was fine in his first role ever, basically. But uh, you know, I just I, I, he was fine. But I, I, I just felt um, there, there was, there's, and the stakes are high for this mo in this movie. Mm -hmm. But I felt like the the tension wasn't really there for me, right? So that there was, a, it was like every everything was just like, hey man, I'll buy some weed. Right here you go. And then it's like, it, it, like it, it was, and I was trying to figure out why, because I mean, this movie even has like a ticking clock, right? So, I mean, I mean, the, um, uh, for those people watching, if there's anyone watching this, uh, that don't know the ticking clock is like a writer's, uh, like trope or the writer's, uh, like tool that creates tension, right? So it's like, whenever, uh, you have a, a you know, like a deadline or, or there's like a bomb going off or whatever, you know, something, there's like a certain amount of time limits, they call it, call it clock. And it creates tension because you know that you, something, whatever has to be done by this time. And it has a very specific ticking clock. You know, you have 72 hours, 56 hours to sell this weed or else, blah, 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 right? And so he's, it, so you feel like it should be like ratcheted tension and stuff, you know, and and, and, and he even like loses a whole bunch of the weed at some point, you know, to like the, this, this, these cops track him down and, and, you know, and, you know, the cop is kind of crazy and holding the gun to him. And you think it should go really hard, but the whole time he's just like, Hey man, want to buy some weed? Element. Like I was like, I was like, I just wanted him to be a little bit more worried. I guess the only right, element so. that tries to jack yeah. up the tension is the Gene Hackman. Yeah. Gene Hackman is like, yeah, I guess, but I, I, thing, right? I, I didn't, I didn't feel ever that he was nervous or worried. You know, what I mean that you know, it, it's just he was just kind of like, yeah, I mean, and yeah, he is supposed to be kind of a druggie, I guess, and some, and it is supposed to be kind of laid back, but at the same time, I, it was, it went almost too far the other way for me. I was just, okay. I wanted, I didn't feel any tension uh, most right. of the time i kind of i wanted i wanted it to be a little bit more like okay you got to get it oh no there's there, i just kind of felt like mm, yeah, all right well maybe it's all maybe it isn't but so i don't know that's one thing i guess that's was, interesting was, because th those things that detracted for you are yeah. kind of exactly what i like about it like oh really okay i i think it's because i saw a lot of films for whatever reason like this when i was growing up on television mm -hmm. and i always gravitated towards these sort of Mm. Um, yeah, these kind of slightly more laid back posts, kind of easy rider counterculture, right? American films of the early 70s. And I, I, I kind of get off on their vibe, and, I, and I'd never seen this one before, and I rather enjoyed it. I mean, it's certainly not. I mean, I went on IMDb, and there's some people who are like, Whoa, they're really over the top, like, uh, say, like a forgotten masterpiece and shit like this. Mm. Like, yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, you know, this yeah. is no. It's not like French Connection or something, which Gene Hackman would go on to. Mm. Do. It was a very different film, right. studio film, but but you know, it's it's not that. But it's just I don't know. I for me, it's it was just a nice, laid back kind of little. I I enjoyed the act of watching it was 
pleasurable. If I'd have had a joint, I would have smoked it, you know. Yeah, yeah. It, it felt like that. It felt like like something you would watch and like tell, hey man, this is you know, small like it just felt like someone smoking weed would want to watch this movie and just relax. Right. I think but you know, being a thriller, I kind of wanted just I wanted a little bit more of like a attention, a little bit I wanted a little more dynamic going up a little more, right? So and then Gene Hackman does it a little bit, but uh um I don't know to be honest and also like uh, spoilers for the end as well. Uh he so Gene Hackman's character just gets uh um just kind of goes crazy. <laughs> And starts, yeah, he, and uh, he starts like, uh, the, I mean, there's like a helicopter and a police chase and stuff, which again should be pretty, you know, you know, uh, climactic and stuff like that, but it just still kind of felt like meh. And then he kind of came out of nowhere and starts shooting at the police helicopter, and and I, so it sort of started to go a little bit off off kilter for me a little bit then, which is that I didn't, he, he seemed to be very, um, involved with self-preservation for the whole movie and then sort of lost his character at the end and at the expense of some action right which i i thought didn't really work that much for me so yeah i mean i i agree with you in in, in one way it could just seem to be kind of like a rushed how exactly we're going to end this man kind of ending right yeah, then, yeah, yeah on the other hand i think what's built into it which is kind of clever is because we don't actually know what's motivating uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I suppose I can maybe. Oh, okay. Maybe there's maybe some there's some really heavy people after mm -hmm. him, right? So right. if he doesn't get it together, he's like might end up in the bottom of the river or something, right? So right, right. Yeah. So I, I kind of gave it the benefit of the doubt because I was enjoying the film in the same way right. as like you said. I decided to go with the fact that because Karen Block does seem like a very, very, very nice, forgiving. Yeah, friend. <laughs> yeah. If you'd have said to me, uh, "Look, I, the man's on my back," right? You would have, "Oh, really? Oh, fuck! I'll help you out there," like you said, right? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. And that was my big. I think I mean, that I wasn't able to get past. I think, which is right. that, I, it, it just seemed like a really contrived uh, conflict, which didn't, right. uh, which I don't really she's, like that much. You know, she's it, you know, it's all my worst, my biggest pet peeve in movies is usually like if you just say what you. Right, say right, the right. one thing to the person and then just the ops the just the choice to not say something which would make everything fine think how is, many uh, films wouldn't exist if they did well that's what i mean it's it's, it's such a such a trope and such an overused yeah. kind of you know like terrible she's, she's writing really writing concept. writing uh concept right Didn't you think she was very good in that role though yeah i thought she was really yeah very very different than mother firefly <laughs> okay yeah, and I thought she was really good, and and definitely I liked the scene where he shows up and he really kind of freaks her out, and she kind of you know runs out the back and so that. So that that was that was pretty good, um, you know. And, and there were lots of good stuff in here. I mean, it was a. It, I'm not saying it was a terrible movie. No, it no. was. Yeah, you know, it was. It was enjoyable. There was a lot of like really good kind of you know vignettes or like little yeah. kind of scenes of him and doing stuff. And it was. I liked the character work. I thought Chris Christopherson was pretty good, based considering he was not really an actor at this point, and you know and. Uh, um, you know, I thought, uh, it was a, it was decent. It just, I just, I, I wanted a little bit right. more, you know, a little bit more tension. But do so. you like his music in general? Do you are you a Chris Christopherson person? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty open. You know, I like, uh, you know, he's more like kind of like soft, soft rock in the '80s, right? Is that kind of his thing, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I know, I, I know a couple of his songs when I hear them, but I, I can't really. Right. Did you notice that the song that plays a lot in this one, the one about you know he's a walk in contradiction and all that, mm. that's the that's the song that um, Sybil Shepherd's character tells Robert De Niro, reminds her of him in Taxi Driver, right? Mm. And then he goes out and buys the Chris Christopherson record for her after taking and taking to the porn theater, and she's like, "Oh, oh okay." That's that's the song she mentions that she thinks Travis Bickle reminds her of. Uh, I see, I see, I see. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I, I mean, also another thing I I quite dig about these films from the early centuries as well. I I I do enjoy I do enjoy me when people are good at it. I do enjoy me a little bit of um ad libbing. I suspect there's quite a bit of it here, like, but not too much. Like, in, like some, I'm sure some of the stuff with Harry Dean Stanton, they must yeah. have come up with on the fly. And and also, I quite like the bit when the cop pulls over 
uh, when Chris Christopherson's in the car with Viva and Joy Bang, and they're like trying to hide the the drugs and stuff, and there's the mm. bag of books. Yeah, I thought that was quite cute. That was that seemed to me unscripted, right? Very, right, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it was like on the one hand you're thinking, well, no, don't deny the cop, but then on the other <laughs> hand, well, it's such a nice little scene. We'll yeah, we'll yeah, 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 there yeah, kind of thing. So. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of Harry Dean Stanton, one thing that made me laugh is like Harry Dean Stanton was always old. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I think he was born an old man. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, this is 1971. He's still old in this movie. <laughs> like yeah. he kind yeah. of always looked like droopy as well. <laughs> yeah, I could was like, I was like, was he ever a young guy? Or so, so, a big yeah, so, fan. They, they even talk a, about how he looks old in this movie. So. I am a big fan of Harry Dean. He always. Yeah, yeah. Whenever you turn always great. Oh, great. Yeah. Great. Is great. Is always great. Yeah. This seems going to be good, at least, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even though he sounds like, the more I hear about him, he seems like <laughs> he was actually kind of, not really difficult or like an asshole or anything like that, but kind of fairly cantankerous, like some of his oh, characters yeah. could be. Apparently, he was quite like that. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that just kind of makes me like him a bit more. Really. Very. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, there we go. Then yeah, that's about it. There's a strange double bill for you. Devil's Rejects, yeah. Disco Pike. I mean, yeah. talk about tonal shifts. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah. Maybe all right. Well, cool. Somewhere between the two is, is yeah. something we can agree on, maybe. I don't know. Right, yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, till next time. Yeah, cheerio.